Jesus, yeah. Boom, I'm recording. All right, All right. we're live. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Sunny, let's just start with, you know, first, just just tell me what you're doing right now. And, you know, uh, how do I introduce you to people if I meet someone and say that I, I was talking to Sunny who is doing this, you know? Uh, what am I doing right now? I am, I'm, I'm essentially a Bitcoin entrepreneur, you know, business <laughs> development guy. I, I consider myself, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, but I, at my heart, I like to solve problems. And I've been doing that for, you know, for pretty much my whole career. I would say uh, the first half of my career was more focused on robotics. I spent a lot of time in that space. I'm really passionate about robotics. Uh, and then the last half of my you know, working life, the last eight years or nine years, I've been pretty much like, you know, full-time dedicated to Bitcoin. <laughs> I mean, within that, we can talk about other things, but that's my main gig. <laughs> awesome. So, you know, back in the day when, when, uh, when in 2017, 2018, um, when we meet an OG, which you are, mm -hmm. uh, the first question I was, how rich are you, right? That used to be my first question like, because you got into Bitcoin very early on. Uh, but now I don't ask that question because uh, over time we learn that, you know, not everybody is going to keep, you know, even if they went to like a had million Bitcoins, they are not going to keep it because every single milestone had a chance to sell and, you know, to uh, cash out. So my question to you is that how, how was this nine years for you? Like what were the moments when you felt like, you know, this is enough. Let me, you know, pull out a little bit and wait for the wait, wait for the next bull run or something like that. That's a good question. That's a good question. So if I had to rephrase, so you're asking me essentially when when did I cash out? I would say I cashed out. Um, so first of all, every time I've cashed out, I've gone on to regret it. You know, you've probably heard oh. that right from from a lot of people. So over time, I've learned the lesson that Bitcoin should, and if you can make it a one-way street, it's the best for you. And, um, and I think the best way to do that is, I mean, the, the term, uh, I mean, because I'm originally from Canada. I don't know if we're going to go into maybe my background story first or what, but um, I used to be like a financial advisor way back in the day. And so there's this concept called dollar cost averaging you know, yeah. a systematic investment plan where you essentially put X number of your monthly earnings or whatever it is into, uh, you know, a mutual fund or whatever. I deploy a similar strategy with crypto now where, you know, um, a certain percentage just goes into Bitcoin and I don't have to think about it. I don't care if the price of Bitcoin goes up or down. It's very like emotionless and, uh, and yeah, and so that, that's how I recommend most people. But on a personal note, you know, I have cashed out in the past. Um, just as one example, um, you know, I remember when uh, I'd, move, I'd taken on a job with a company called Buttercoin and I'd moved to Bombay. This was back in like 2014. They were backed by Google, this and that. And, um, you know, in that process, I remember, you know, we needed to get a place in Bombay. And you need in India, you need to put down like 11 months or something worth of rent. It's not like, uh, you yeah, know, in yeah. Canada, where it's like one or two months. So, so you know, at that point in time, I, I didn't have a ton of cash lying around. So I remember we liquidated a big, bit of Bitcoin to, to make that payment. And, you know, again, every time went on to regret it, you know, whether it's buying an iPhone, whether whatever. So now we've, we've learned the hard lesson that unless we like absolutely have to, we, we never we never sell. Mm -hmm. The goal is to just hold forever. And, and by ever, I mean like like beyond death. Like, like it's an intergenerational plan right now. Holy shit, yeah. I don't plan to hold my Bitcoin for my kids. You get your own Bitcoin if you have to. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I did. So I, I um, you know, I got in in 2017. So I didn't really, I got in when, you know, there was a lot of hype and uh, the bull run was right around the corner. I made money, but I did cash out because that's what we, we learned, right? Um, growing up, like we learned that 20, 50% is a lot of money, a lot of profit, right? And uh, that's when you cash out. Like I've seen my parents, my grandparents do that on the stock market. So mm. I cashed out, right? 200, 300, 500% profit. And now, 
now that i think about it that's minuscule you know when it comes to crypto because the jumps are really really high uh and you never know ever, yeah sorry go ahead go ahead amish right now you never know we'll come to that but you know did you you say that you cashed out in emergencies like the, i would call these it's like when life came up yeah like just periodic times where you just you know you didn't save enough or you know whatever it was um yeah just there's just like you know multiple times a couple times in our life where we did cash out but again every time when under regret it i would say the shift for me was when i stopped looking at uh like dollars or rupees as my benchmark of wealth and i started measuring my wealth in bitcoin terms like you know when it's like i want x number of bitcoin by this age uh that i found to be a lot more like empowering and you know and now i measure to some extent i think a lot of people do you know how many bitcoins do you have instead of or how many you know satoshis do you have i do i, I asked that question like i used to ask this question to a lot of people who talk about bitcoins right um obviously nobody is going to answer that question but i also want to ask you that did you ever cash out to like diversify your investment because a lot of people do that as well like one of these analysts i met he was purely into bitcoin but in 2017 he said that his net worth went in like his net worth the percentage of his uh, wealth was so much in bitcoin that he got scared and he had to diversify um right so did you ever like cash oh, out oh you mean diversifying into other like traditional assets or do you mean into other like cryptos because those are two different conversations <laughs> <laughs> I would assume that um, you know if you who would have diversified it would be in crypto as in you know very very less and you would have probably diversified into real estate or some other asset mm. as well but mm. you can answer that question but both yeah just let's No I'm it. I'm I'm not going to lie so I used to be like I said I used to be like a financial advisor I used to have all my licenses so I I used to really believe in in a lot of that um and I probably should be more diversified and more invested in other things than I am currently which is like real estate and you know all these like normal sounding things but I I don't know I have this like weird and I don't I don't think other people should prescribe to this because I think you know risk is a function of information and control right so i feel like i have a lot of information about bitcoin and therefore i have this strong position right so for most people i don't recommend that they put more than 1% of their total wealth into bitcoin i don't recommend that they put more per more than 1% of their cash flow monthly cash flow into bitcoin because i recognize that it's highly speculative and it's experimental and i would never advise others to take on like crazy risk never um i personally have some sort of problem <laughs> where i just i i love bitcoin and and to me every time i and i have kids and i have a family you know i have responsibilities so i'm not saying that you know you people i even take weird risks but i i try you know every month uh, as much as i can to put as much money into bitcoin as possible because i'm very scared of everything else because all of it is based on fiat all of it is like kind of you know you know and so so and so when i don't and i have so many concerns about money printing and inflation i just don't see you know maybe you could say oh well gold well gold should be you know maybe maybe the best potential alternative asset but i can't if you feel like sunny send me a little bit of gold i need you know a loan i can't send it to you uh you know what i mean and it's like heavy you can't carry it around the world so bitcoin is just it's just incredible right it's just i actually so many things in it that yeah so i'm i'm probably a bit too crypto heavy or bitcoin heavy let's not even say crypto <laughs> and and in terms of in terms of experimenting on the other side i'll be honest i uh i i think i've said this publicly enough times i'm kind of a a bitcoin maximalist on a personal note and i only believe in bitcoin and uh and i try and i've been really close to you know projects like ethereum uh because i'm from toronto and i literally knew you know got uh, the guys who behind ethereum well before ethereum was even a word and so i saw the emergence of ethereum and to my detriment i guess to my financial detriment i did not uh partake in any of that and and you know and so so yeah so i i could be way way wealthier but i i've been you know kind of sticking to bitcoin not because of any other reason than to me it's not about getting rich it's about 
you know, getting rich, but also doing the right thing and being like principle oriented. And, and to me, Bitcoin just brings together so many different interesting concepts and ideas that, um, that, yeah, that I it just caught my imagination. And I think a lot of other people are like that. And like, it's like this, it's more than, you know, I did a, I just interviewed Max Kaiser recently. Uh, I'm going to release that soon. And, you know, he was equating it to like a, like a religion, like, you know, like Satoshi is God. And there's people literally that, that feel that way. And so I think I've, I've maybe, you know, taken that pill a bit too far. Yeah. <laughs> uh, interesting. You say that, but you know what? Um, I think that the people, people actually strongly believe in Bitcoin. And uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't bring myself to, strongly believe in bitcoin because right now i also measure my wealth in fiat money uh for some reason because i'm in india maybe because that is why um but anyways uh putting all of that aside i understand uh you know you are a bitcoin maximalist now let's talk about you know let's go nine ten years back when you actually got into it right hmm. uh, how did it start how did you learn about it how did you get into it I think what we might be a bit helpful for your audience is just I'll spend like a minute on my background. So I, even though my parents are from Calcutta, I, um, you know, I actually, I grew up in, in Canada. I spent like the first half of my life in Alberta, Edmonton, and the last, you know, had 20 years of my life in Toronto with a kind of a, a five-year period where I lived in India. Actually, even as a kid, I lived in India. So I spent a lot of time in India. Um, so yeah, so I studied electrical engineering. After electrical engineering, I became a financial advisor because I had this like deep kind of rooted question in my head, which is like, what is money? And I could never, and, and so I thought, okay, if I become a financial advisor, I'll finally learn, you know, what money is. And after I did that for like years, I, one day I was like, I still don't get it. Like I, no one has been able to explain what money is to me. And these people wear beautiful suits. I go to these you know, tall buildings and, you know, downtown Toronto, but everyone just waves their hand and uses like fake math and they don't really explain what money is. I'm like, I just give me a simple explanation. And that, you know, and it's kind of like how you ask questions like, what is religion? You know, what is politics? Like you ask these deep seated questions and sometimes it's hard to find an answer. And money was like, to me, the ultimate because everybody young and old, you know, just is fascinated by it. Like my grandmother, I mean, she's not alive anymore, but at the time what she was, she'd be fascinated by money. My, you know, two-year-old kid, you, she understands that, you know, you can go to Toys R Us and, and turn it, the, the money into something and toys and so, so I was always fascinated by what is it? And, you know, people get into divorces, people get into wars over money. I mean, money runs the world, but everybody I'd ask, well, what is it? They couldn't give me a damn answer. <laughs> so for me, that was my initial root of what eventually led me to like kind of seeing the light, if you will, with Bitcoin. I read a lot about it. You know, I, I followed the Occupy Wall Street movement, followed the Ron Paul movement and, you know, and the Fed, this, that. And, but my problem with everything was that they were all pointing to problems. None of them were like, here's a solution. Um, and so as a re reason, I always felt like I was playing catch up. Like, you know, when, when I used to measure everything in fiat terms, for example, one thing I noticed is that life would always get harder. Like every month, there'd be more months than money, you know, like whether it's after taxes and inflation and, you know, rent and food and this, you barely have any money left over at the end of the month. And it was like running on a hamster wheel and I could never figure out why, like, again, so once you get a kind of a grasp of what money is, like how humanity somehow convinced ourselves that we should put pictures of people's faces on it and then pass it around and it's literally paper, um, once you get over that, then you start asking like, well, what is inflation? Like, I remember just yesterday, my mom was like, you know, the Canadian government's giving everyone money now. Like, this is great. But she's like, where does that money come from? And I was like, mom, like, that's why I got into Bitcoin eight years ago, right? Because where does that money come from? And it doesn't even come from printing. It comes from some guy sitting on a computer just adding zeros. And to me, the fact that the money supply was infinite meant that 
you know, you could never have like financial freedom for anyone. And you could like tell them about the best strategies and the, you know, mutual funds that'll outperform based on charts from the past, even though the past doesn't equal the future. All these weird games that the that the financial industry play, I was just starting to see through it. And anyway, so I'm diverging. I said I'd spend a minute on this, but obviously I lied. Um, the next piece was I, I was I felt kind of you know turned off by by money in the financial world, so I left from twenty almost eight years I spent in in robotics. My wife's a mechatronics engineer. We drive a Tesla. We have like quad rotors and, you know, we, we nice. love the 3D printers. We're like huge into robots. My kids are all into like my, my, my five-year-old daughter does like Lego for like 15 year olds. Like she's all into math and we're, we're big into robotics. So I spent eight years in robotics. Um, there's a bit of a story there, but I'll just kind of fast forward through it. And then the CEO of that company at one point was like, you know, you look, Indian he's like why don't you help us go sell some robots out in India like they've got all these you know smart universities and what, whatnot and so I was you know essentially spent four or five years traveling around the before moving to India traveling around to all the major robot labs around the world and outfitting labs Stanford Georgia Tech IIT MIT NIT you name it I've been to every single like awesome like robot lab in the world and not all of them but many of them and and that eventually around 2011 or so, I was living in India and I just, and I just, I don't know how I came across the white paper and just became, you know, madly obsessed uh, and, and kind of fell down the rabbit hole. But I think your question was more about like, I guess, was it about UnoCoin and how we started that? Or I wanted no, to give a little bit of background, I but, but Bitcoin, the Bitcoin story, at least that's how it started. And then, you know, I, I ended up in India, Bitcoin and started doing meetups. So when did, when, when was this? 2020, now we're in 2011, 20, I moved to India, into Bangalore. And really what it was, um, Namish, is, is I saw in Toronto, Anthony Diorio, these guys doing Bitcoin meetups. And I was like, every week or every month, I felt like I was missing out. So then one day I started looking for other people doing meetups. There were some guys, uh, I mean, Benson, I don't know if you know him, but there were some other guys that were doing meetups. It was just maybe three, four of us. Um, you know, we all met up in a coffee shop. And at one point, uh, I think Benson got a bit tired of it. He just said, oh, you just run it, Sonny. And I just like ran with it. And, you know, and for me, I was like, okay, like Bitcoin is like, it's, it's legit, right? So why don't we start doing our meetups at Leela Palace? <laughs> just just yeah. a little, little bit of oh, yeah. you. Sure, sure. When did you hear about it? Like how? That was, that is what I'm curious uh, Definitely about. Twitter. I'm pretty sure okay. I heard it about it in Twitter. I think, okay, the person will probably deny this, but I think it was a colleague by the name of, I thought it was a guy named Lior in my Kwanzaa job that it at first kind of mentioned it, I thought, but I think I've, I've asked him since then. He's like, no, I, I don't think I heard it back then. But I feel like I heard it once or twice and I kind of dismissed it. Um, and then there was actually a guy from Toronto. Oh, I can't believe I forgot. Oh, Da Vinci, Da Vinci. He, if you know about him, uh, he was doing YouTube videos back in the day. And you can go look him up even still today. There's a guy named Da Vinci 15, or I can send you the thing, but Da Vinci is his name. And he's out of Toronto, I think. He's out of Canada. And he was just making these YouTube videos about like Bitcoin, how amazing it is, this and that. And it was literally just like YouTube that I just kind of, and then I was living with my grand. She was living with me. My grandma was living with me at the time. And so, you know, I, like I would just tell her about it. <laughs> like every day I'd be learning about it and telling her about it. And so it was more just, yeah, it was this idea that I came across really, I would say on the internet to a large extent and just, yeah. And then look, I said, I was living in India. I didn't really have friends uh, there at the time or whatever. And so just, you know, and, and, and just started becoming like obsessed where, you know, you know, you've heard of some people where they don't like sleep or eat. They're just like so into it. And then after six months, I got tired of, of just like obsessing over it and boring my grandmother over it. Right. I was just like, I want to meet, like, I was like, I, I was convinced that I didn't want to just make friends for the sake of making friends. Like I didn't want to talk about, you know, football or cricket. Like that wasn't really my passion. I wanted to talk about Bitcoin and I wanted to be surrounded by people that were equally as passionate as me. And, and my vehicle for doing that was, was meetup.com, right? Like literally, like I encourage, I don't know if it's a big scene still, but 
you know, anybody who has any idea that's trying to start something, I encourage them that, well, oh my God, now meetup is even difficult because you have COVID and all that, but, you know, maybe Zoom meetups or something. But I think getting together with like-minded individuals is kind of the first, you know, like natural step that came to me in terms of like wanting to do something. Right. Okay. That's interesting. So now let's talk about UnoCoin, you know, and mm -hmm. how that yeah so i mean these meetups eventually so th through these meetups we were just our, our idea was we were obsessed we knew we wanted to do something and we didn't know what that something was so we just took a scientific approach towards trying to identify what the next big business opportunity might be and the way science works is you have a hypothesis which is you just guess and you throw an idea out there and then you let the world tell you whether, you know, that idea has any legs. Like, I, I, and it's very simple, right? So we were like, okay, so Bitcoin is the idea that we wanted to do something around. So what are the different things we could do? Hey, let's mine Bitcoin. So one day, one guy, we said, hey, we're going to go buy some, you know, mining equipment from all over the world. Go fly to New York, go pick them up and bring them over. Okay, go, go to fly here and go bring them over. We'll just order them from here. And it, let's, we'll get like a couple from every miner out there so we can learn. That was our, our main objective was like, we know we were going to fail, um, but we didn't care, right? We we're just like, let's just learn. Let's learn about Bitcoin. And even if we fail, it's okay. And we actually did. We failed. We lost a lot of, you know, when you ask about like Bitcoin and all that, we lost a ton of money on Bitcoin, right? <laughs> on, on Bitcoin mining. I remember one project, we put in a hundred Bitcoin and we got 30 back or something like that, right? And so, so again, I could look back and be like, oh, that was like the worst ever, but you know, we wouldn't like have Unocoin today. I, I don't think if we weren't like experimenting and making mistakes and losing money. And by the way, a hundred Bitcoins back then, $10 a Bitcoin or whatever, you know, it didn't seem or whatever, $20 a Bitcoin didn't seem like a lot, but but yeah, so, so Unocoin really came to be out of like a series of experimenting. We did events at the, you know, at, what is it, Sheraton, right? I think we did one of the first like large scale uh, Bitcoin events in India. It was called the Global Bitcoin Conference. There's, you know, references of it online here and there. Um, and I remember it was 2013 and uh, because I've spoken to the other founders of Unocoin explicitly, right? Like, because yeah, yeah. sorry. Because I was at the court and I was there with the Harish and I've spoken to Satvik and all of them. So I know that. And, you know, all the people who were there. And I kind of feel um, really bad that I wasn't there because uh, 2013 when I was, I heard about Bitcoin on videos. Where were you? Time, Where were you was, during that time? 2013, I was in um, Hyderabad, I think. Yeah, I was in Deloitte. I used to work in Deloitte. Uh, so as a consultant, so I did, I heard about Bitcoin, but I never really paid attention. And I'm kind of thinking that I should have at the time, but anyways, what's done is done. So I know that that meetup, um, was quite an event, right. And a lot of people showed up and a lot of people expressed their opinion. And some of them have turned against Bitcoin as well. Uh, I don't know if you know, but the NA Vijay Shekhar or Shankar or that there's a there's an old guy who was into cyber security cyber law and uh, he was there at the meetup and he spoke about i think um, uh, mining and you know uh, the concept of mining and all that and then he's turned against it now but we'll come to that go on sorry i sorry to interrupt i just every time i hear about that first few days of nishit desai and you know you guys coming together no Suri, Suri and, you know, you guys all doing meet us together and all those things. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there's, it's pretty interesting because they, yeah, that, that day in December, 2013, there's a couple of things that are important around that. So on a personal note, I, so I, I, I was in this like robotics job, right. Essentially for like eight years, but I was at that point, I was just obsessed with Bitcoin and I knew my heart was kind of pulling me in that direction. And so because of this event and I was kind of the, like I was, came up with the idea to do it and all that, right? So we were planning it, organizing it. And uh, and, and like the way that me and Sattvic work is, is that I'm more like an idea networker, business, you know, idea type of guy. And he's more like a hardcore executioner where he can just like take ideas and make them reality and like the snap of a finger. He's just, he's really good at making the invisible visible. And, and therefore I give him most of the credit for like everything that's happened with Unocoin, right? I'm just more like 
a storyteller. I just like tell stories about what we do. Um, but no, I was going to say is, is that, yeah. So I, what happened is, is I, because of that event, I ended up getting, I, we, we ended up having this, the CEO of a company called Buttercoin reach out. Um, and, uh, and that company was backed by, as I mentioned earlier, it was backed by Google. There was, um, they had come out of Y Combinator. They were based in Silicon Valley and they were building essentially an order book exchange for Bitcoin. And then they wanted to tap remittance into that. And so when him and I met, he was like, Hey, you know, we're just closing a big round. Why don't you come on board with us full time? And I always wanted to work for Google, right? It's like, who doesn't? Like I use Google all the time. And I was just like, it'd be great to get a bit of experience. And so that was my Fourier into Bitcoin. And I joined that company as their head of business development. And I was actually working there during this event that we talked that we launched UnoCoin at. So even though I was a part of UnoCoin and I had actually bought UnoCoin, you know, the domain on GoDaddy. And the reason it's called UnoCoin is because my wife is from Colombia, right? I'm learning Spanish. Uno means one in Spanish. And even though I had been like an integral part of like crafting the idea and the team, I really was like just compelled to go work for Buttercoin. Sorry, you go ahead. Don't translate it. I, I don't think it's a wise idea to translate uh, no coin into one coin. You know? Oh my God, Ruja? <laughs> no, actually, my name, nickname is Ruja. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, no. Uh, hopefully the, yeah, yeah, right? Like, yeah, we don't want to associate with that one. It's a good thing we didn't call it one coin. It's a good thing we called it Uno coin. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, I see your point. I see your point. Um, but anyway, so anyway, so we thought, I mean, but, but just to, to finish that translation we thought bitcoin was the one coin right that's why we kind of were like okay um but i ended up taking this bit of a divergent path and it was about a year after that um that barry silbert had invested in uno coin um and then i just felt compelled obviously to come back to uno coin because like what like barry sees something in this thing that i don't even see that we helped start and uh, and barry silbert is obviously another you know, kind of key player in, in UnoCoin's yeah. like existence and all that, right? Um, but no, so at that event though, just to rewind, so uh, we were doing it and I was living in Bombay at the time, even though the event was in Bangalore. And at the end of the event, I ended up meeting this guy named Surreal Desai, who was the son of Nishit Desai. And Surreal yeah. and I, we were like, hey, we're on the same flight back. Like he was sitting front row at the event. He's like, we're sitting front, we were sitting, uh, we were flying back to Bombay together. And in that whole process, he tells me about his father and who his dad is and how he's like a god among men. You know, he's like crazy. Like Nishith is insane, right? And Nishith is probably one of the most important players in this that people probably don't even know about. So anyway, so I think the next day, Hari, Satak, all of us, we met Nishith Desai in his office. And uh, when we went, it was like a couple of days after the event. And we had just launched UnoCoin at that event. And we didn't even think it would do anything. We thought like we, just like all the other projects we did that were a bit of a failure, we kind of assumed that this would also be, you know, would fall flat on its face. And so we were in Bombay, we were, you know, having fun. We were, we had, we met Nishit in his office. And, and I just remember our first experience with him. He was like schooling us about Bitcoin. He was teaching us like when we were like, we thought we were experts. And, but yet he was the one you know, kind of laying it down. And and it was, and we were just like, okay, this is the guy that we need to work with at, at long-term. And Initiate's like, you know, um, yeah, they, they've been our, our kind of one of our key lawyers since then, right? And you probably know the story with even the IAMAI and Initiate, uh, his guys being really, really involved with that. And so that's kind of the, that's how we had tied the piece together. Um, another person I think that was very noteworthy that was at that event, I don't remember the people that turned against Bitcoin, but I remember the people that stick with Bitcoin. And one guy is uh, Mahin. So Mahin is uh, the CTO I, of ZebPay. And I love Mahin. I, I will say that on, on the record. I uh, These guys are, I actually bought my first Bitcoin from a service that they had way back in the day as well. And so I will never forget that. And yeah, and so, so you know, Mahin was at that event, he spoke. And anyway, so, you know, long story short, um, when we came back, to the drawing board, we were a bit surprised that there were hundreds of orders piling up at UnoCoin. And we were like, oh my God, like maybe we found something, right? And I think, you know, um, and, then, and then I remember it was around Christmas time. So I'd flown out to Colombia to my family's place. And 
I don't know if you know this, but like a week or two into our launching of the business, we had like 30 people from the tax department show up at our front door at a uno coin uh, office. And I remember I was, I was reading all this on like the news on Twitter, like thinking, Oh my God, like this is scary. And I called Satvik and I said, Satvik, like, let's just give up on this Bitcoin thing. Right. Like, you know, why, why are we going to take on all this risk? Like, this is scary. Like, I don't want you guys to get in trouble. This is like a, a side project, right. That, that like, why are we going to risk everything for it? And Satvik said, Sunny, you know, you're like, Canadian, whatever, you're going to go start some business somewhere else. You're going to do whatever. But he's like, if I give up on Bitcoin today, my entire country loses out on Bitcoin, right? Like, like we can't just stand down. We're not doing anything wrong. We're even doing KYC. We're, you know, we're like from a regulatory perspective, like we even have, like, we're, we're doing everything right. So he's like, if we're doing everything right, let's, let's, you know, keep doing business. And it was, I would say, Satvik's kind of like singular, um, like, you know, his, his ability to stand in the face of adversity that led UnoCoin and, and to some extent even Bitcoin to, to happen, you know, in, in India, or at least that's my, my view of it. Um, yeah, yeah. So that, that's a bit of the story around, you know, UnoCoin and the VED and Bitcoin, you know, we, I could talk forever, but I don't know. Do you want to maybe switch gears no. or something else? <laughs> To be out there in the public people should know that you know you know coin or uno coin i used to call it uno coin for some reason but uno coin stood ground um then it stood ground now uh in 2018 unfortunately Satvik and harish were uh you know sent to jail for a couple of days uh, for launching a kiosk and bad marketing from or the media people you know writing a bad article about it it led to a chaos, but they stood ground. Now they have indicated with the recent funding round. So congratulations for that as well. Um, you know, from from Draper. Uh, yeah, yeah I was gonna say you know not just the funding round, but also I don't know if you followed the court case uh, closely, I, but I was there in the court. I was with. I so I was gonna say is is one of the main points that came up was the fact that you know they wanted an example of when somebody's human rights were violated, and that you know, arguably yeah, wrongful arrest was what, what was what came up. So I was going to say the, the court, the justice system vindicated. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I stand corrected, right? The, the first vindication came when the justice system vindicated Harish. I agree. Uh, the second is that the model exists. The model has potential. That vindication came from the funding round recently, right? And not just Uno coin. In fact, a lot of cryptocurrency exchanges now are um, having really big names backing them up, uh, which sort of shows that, you know, Indian market is the place to be right now. Um, It's just maybe five years later, but it is still there. Um, So that's a good thing. Uh, Rewind again to that event and, you know, starting UnoCoin and all that. Um, uh, You said, you spoke about Mahin, right? And you said that you bought your first Bitcoin uh, from a service that they had. Was it buy, uh, buy and sell Bitcoin.in, right? That was- even before that. Even before that. We had something called, I don't know if, if these guys are okay with me mentioning it, but they, they had something called, I think, I think, I might be wrong. I think it was called Mr. Bitcoin. Is it? Okay, that's amazing. Called Mr. Bitcoin. I think it was Mr. Bitcoin. And it was literally, I'd never forget it. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I have screenshots of it, but um, of like just a picture of a, like a Superman looking character with, you know, yeah, that, that's, oh, that yeah. was the first. And then buy, sell Bitcoin from what I remember was like the, the iteration of that. It was like a bit of a better domain. And, but, but keep in mind at that time, buy, sell Bitcoin was a very simple, uh, like just one page website where you would go and just put your, you know, your, your, your private, your public keys and whatnot. You'd go to the bank, deposit some cash, and then you'd have your Bitcoin. There was no, like, you know, wallet. There was no, I knew that, but it worked. It worked. It worked. It worked. It worked. It worked. But now, uh, right. Uh, I mean, I think that we are going full circle out now with the DeFi moment and all that people are sort of People who are in crypto are also understanding the importance of, you know, semi-custodial approach to things like, you know, not putting all of their funds in the custodial wallets or exchanges, but also, you know, taking control of the funds when they're, which was the goal initially as well, right? So all the people who got in like later on, uh, they sort of started trusting the exchanges a lot more, which is a good thing because exchanges can protect them. Uh, but the goal was always to sort of be your own boss. There will be 
keep be in control of your own money which is which i'm seeing now happening again right what do you think about that oh yeah from i mean from day one uno coins always had the option to you know retrieve to get your bitcoin to your own you uh, know wallet yeah. Uh, yeah. as well so we strongly and you know from day one we've also had the ability to for you to print your own yes uh you know and just, yeah it's still, I mean, it's we're, we're definitely I, I did it i yeah oh 100 no look we are big fans of you know sovereign self-sovereignty of freedom of people taking responsibility over their lives but we're also like pra- like we're pragmatic in the sense that we know that most people don't want to do that and they just want a simple wallet they can sell to they just want to make sure that if they forget the password they can call someone they they want something that looks and feels unfortunately like a bank you know or something similar to that and so we that was our kind of insight was that you know is that you know that that something like that's going to emerge in India and so why not be the first ones to do it is build a platform and i'd say that was the big distinction between or i would say between everything that came before us and and what uno coin kind of brought to the market was we were the first ones to have banking and payment processing e-commerce kind of like you know sip like systematic and like now cash app just said that they're launching it and big deal whatever this is that we did it like subject did it in 2014 you know 2015 yeah. that was one of our first offerings so so these things yeah, that i'm yeah. talking so, about hmm. you, okay my first exchange was actually uno coin and my first transaction was maybe 1000 rupees but the second transaction was a SIP like the systematic buying plan SBP actually what you have on uno coin right so 100 rupees i put like 10000 100 rupees every day i was buying um of course you know price was going up so i sold them early and i made a profit but uh, i didn't keep it until now but yeah and a lot of people we ran a poll on uh, twitter and a lot of people actually um got involved with two exchanges right uno coin and zepe uno coin yep. and zepe and we love zepe we love zepe <laughs> like we love the message like obviously right cuz like i i actually i am not i don't know if people know the story but i called uh mahin before we started uno coin i said mahin I love what you're doing. I love everything you're doing. I said, "Can you give me a job?" Like I said, "I will cl- I will sweep your floors. I will do whatever you want me to do." I'm like, "I want to work for you." And initially, I think he said, he's like, "Yeah, you want to come, you know, help us?" Sure, but then at, after a certain point, I think he saw that I was super serious and he was like, "Sunny, he's like, instead of, you know, you working for me, he's like, "Why don't you guys start your own company?" and we create like an industry right we create an ecosystem so that you know because that's what you want right you want to compete you want people to get you know the best services yeah, yeah. and and so that's what we decided to do but i i still love those guys um, i know oh, they have a, they've had a change in ownership right um so you know i don't i don't want to say too much but but like the founding team uh, especially mahin specifically and he kind of operates in the background a bit but i i don't know i, I i'm very uh, thankful for him for him um, to be you know part of this world Mahin is amazing. I've spoken to him a couple of times and, uh, you know, uh, he has been the background of it. You know, he's been in the background. Like the face has been always Sandeep and then Ajit and all those people. But uh, funny you mentioned the competition part because the important thing is actually competition is actually healthy uh, for the ecosystem to grow, right? Because uh, even when Microsoft was, you know, enjoying its monopoly, um apple came along again you know tried to grab it and then microsoft was invested in apple when apple was actually competing against microsoft so that makes a, so, a lot of sense because you need a competitor to sort of better yourself um anyways so now 2013 is done uno coin is launched what what went on after that you know uh, rbi actually after the uno coins launch rbi uh, also put out that warning um you know that people need to a week stay later yeah yeah a week, a week later yeah so soon i thought it was a month or two but maybe but yeah, yeah. i don't know i thought it was a week but anyways yeah yeah go ahead what happened after that like i i uh, we'll also come to i want to set the uh, you know pretext uh, we are, we'll come to the play, point where you know we were seeing you know, uno coin stickers in goa in bangalore and all the places as well so how did we come to that from you know starting uno coin how did we come to that level So Uno coin so one thing so Barry Silbert invested in 2014 he was like I said to some extent believed in the company even before me even though we helped found it um he's really integral to I'd say in the, in terms of like you know like us going okay yeah this is like super real like we need to focus and so once we all started coming together and and building it wasn't you know it was just a matter of uh again just the same way we got to Uno coin that was the approach we deployed deployed 
like ongoing in the sense that we'd have lots of ideas. We, you know, put them out there to the market in a small beta way and, and see if people like it. If people don't, we take it off the market. If people do, we build on it. That's it. And so e-commerce, right, is a big part of the equation. So like, uh, so Uno Point is like, like a, it's like a brokerage platform. It's a very simple like buy sell model, right? Like we have Uno DAX, which we're rolling into Uno Coin. We'll get into that later. That's more like an order book exchange, but our roots um, are really in like like trying to simplify Bitcoin, make it easy for like my mom or anyone to get into Bitcoin, right? That's been always like kind of our mission. Um, but you know, like I said, the Buttercoin company that I worked for, we were building an order book exchange. So we we obviously understood as like a team like the importance of building order book exchanges and things like that way back in the day. I like I said, I knew Ethereum guys before Ethereum was even a thing. So it wasn't like we were blindsided by it. We were late, I would say, to the market to launch both those things, and that you know cost us uh, from a competitive standpoint. But at the same time, you know, like, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so Unocoin, but to answer your question, how it showed up in Goa and all that, it was essentially, you know, we have something similar to BitPay, you know, which is like a easy, if you're a merchant, you can easily accept Bitcoin and we take the Bitcoin, convert it into rupees and put it in your bank account. Because as a merchant, you don't want to touch Bitcoin. You want to enable people to pay in Bitcoin, but you don't want to because you have to now convince, you know, your CFO, you have to get all your business partners, like the accounting department, on this new currency that's fluctuating, da, da, da. so it's best to just convert, it, you know, into rupees. So, you know, we we saw that as being like a market opportunity. So, so that's how, you know, you see kind of a lot of people printing those QR codes, and, and it kind of went viral from there. But you know, systematic buy and plan, lots of things, right? Another another I think um, thing that came to us from the market was we had a lot of people um, saying, hey, look, when I, like IT professionals, right? People who take, big, like they, they get paid from, let's say someone in San Francisco or whatever. They, they say, look, if I use like the traditional rails, it takes me like an hour before, I mean, sorry, a week before I get paid. It, you know, if I get sent a thousand dollars, I get 900. But when I use Unocoin and Bitcoin, I get like the same money and I get it like right away. Like, this is crazy. So, but they, but they said, look, but we have a problem. The problem is, is sometimes my guys will pay me while I'm sleeping. I wake up in the morning and the price of Bitcoin has gone down. So I lose a little bit of money. So we're like, okay, why don't we offer a Bitcoin address that auto sells? So you, if you give anyone that address, they'll just auto sell it, put the rupees in your bank account. So th those are examples. I could give like a hundred examples of things like that, that we've tried to build because the market has kind of, you know, asked for it, or, or there was an idea that we thought would have legs, and we just try it and see if uh, if it works or not. But yeah, but that that's kind of, I guess, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but like how it showed up all over. It's just like, that's one of our products. Mm -hmm. No, um, it did answer the, answer the question, right? I mean, what I wanted to understand is that, how was it that, you know, Unocoin was everywhere, and now let's talk about, you know, how is it that uh, you said you you brought it up yourself that, you know, you lost a little bit of competitive edge uh, because you were late in building the order book exchange. You were late in introducing Ethereum on the platform. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and in the same lines, you know, there was a Bitcoin cash controversy that happened that you guys did not want to support it. And then you had to distribute them uh, to the people. Mm. Uh, so now let's keep ahead because you know that journey uh, just, just so just one small piece in there that i kind of overlooked is we did do a funding round around i think 2016 2017 as well where yeah. um bloom ventures led the round and we had uh you know we had some great investors come in like funders club and mumbai angels and all ventures so there was that that helped as well um but yeah but around that time one thing that started happening is you know these like random like crypto assets started popping up in the market and started becoming very very popular and look, we and and it, it, maybe it was our love for bitcoin that kind of i guess you could say blinded but i could also argue help preserve our you know <laughs> our ability to sleep at night uh so like we have a lot of so, i mean one of our concerns has been like we don't want to we're not trying to offer people a gambling site right and uh and it kind of became that way um there were i won't name the competitors but a lot of competitors were just they were their strategy was we want to find the cheapest coin out there and just list it i won't name who that is but they know who they are 
My point <laughs> is, is that's not a strategy. That's like a strategy to screw people. Like that's that it's going to make you a ton of money. But my point is, is that in the name of the free market and, you know, people have the freedom to do it. I think what started happening is the market started gravitating towards these what many call shit coins, right? And we didn't know what the real ones were, what weren't. And here's the other thing is because of my, um, you know, background in financial services, I also knew that a lot of what these guys were doing wasn't legit. You cannot take money for like Uno coin. If anybody should be doing an ICO, it should be us, right? Our, the name coin is in our name from 2011. We have the best investors in the world. Why would we not turn it into a coin? Because it's risky and it's wrong. You don't take money from your neighbor and with the hope that you're going to build the speculative business. You go to people like Tim Draper. You go to the billionaires of the world who even if we lose their 100000 or whatever million dollars, they're not going to lose sleep because they take risky bets. So we were slow to that party. Uh, do I regret it? Maybe not, right? Did we make as much money as our competitors? No. But, you know, so that was one maybe piece. Now, you know, this yesterday, the CFTC chairman said he loves Ethereum, right? We're still not ether heads, but guess what? We have Ethereum as an option on our platform. It's reached enough ubiquity and it's proven us wrong on the innovation side to some extent that we do list it now. I'm not going to lie. I still worry um, about listing anything but Bitcoin. Like I still think about and talk to Satik about Satik. Let's go all in on Bitcoin. It might mean less money short term, but we'll be able to sleep at night, you know, with a lot of assurance, right? And so things like the DAO hack, things like, you know, there's a lot of things that's happened in the Ethereum world that's validated our, I would say, initial assumption that we shouldn't be so quick to list everything. And we called it UnoCoin because we believe that Bitcoin was the one. Anyways, there's that. The order book exchange piece, like I said, I worked for an order book exchange backed by Google back in 2014. To say that we didn't see that, we did. But we felt that the complexities of an order book exchange were perhaps a bit premature. I, on a personal note, disagreed with that, right? I fought hard for UnoCoin to launch an order book in 2014 and have been fighting for it since. But yeah, due to business reasons, you know, we, we decided that UnoCoin would be better off. And in retrospect, I think it was a mistake. I think we should have disrupted our own business far earlier and we should have built the order book exchange far earlier but guess what now we've got uno dax and we're gonna build it sorry i got a little emotional there but, oh, but is, you know good that, topics right? <laughs> it's not just about that it's not see maybe in 2014 it wasn't the right time to launch an audiobook exchange uh you know maybe um and i know i know because i when i started in cryptocurrency in 2017 um, I did the same thing that you were asking Mahim to do, right? I joined an exchange and I said, I'll mean manage your community for free, uh, right? And imagine this, like I was a consultant back in Deloitte, like when I quit my job uh, and I was sitting at home and I was helping, an ex I was customer support for them, right? And I know 100, 90 out of the 100 customers did not even know what is a market order and what is a limit order and how to place an order, right? So, uh, Zeppe and UnoCoin were, were great exchanges to actually just have this one click buy option, right? What you get once OC something, there's an abbreviation for that, right? So uh, that was great and everybody loved it. And I know um, so many people I've met along the, in these three years who actually exclusively use only these two exchanges. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that UnoCoin was the best. There were times when Zeppe was actually exceeding uh, Unocoin in a lot, lot of other things, right? And there was a time when Unocoin, Unocoin was actually ahead of Zeppe in a lot of other things as well. But these two were pioneers, right? There's no doubt about it. They changed the business. They changed the landscape of cryptocurrency in India. They uh, brought in legitimacy to the asset, uh, to the asset class. And then these competitors came along and they just disrupted the business and they, they just you know, showed you guys that there's a lot more things that can be done as well. Uh, and it kind of worked out, right? Now we, now we have a very healthy... Um, Sorry, Namish. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, carry on. That was my bad. Yeah, carry on, continue. No, no, I couldn't hear you because you were saying... No, 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 something. I just, I was going to, I was going to say that I agree with you. Yeah, and they all, I was going to say they also showed us how not to do things. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, um, uh, you know, now I know, you know, some of the plans that UnoCoin has getting into derivatives, some more innovative products, 
um right so but what are you doing this <laughs> like, what you doing? I we, know, we, ne we never talk about the future so whoever said that is lying <laughs> no i'm kidding I, we're thinking about it we're thinking about it yeah. <laughs> you guys, you guys sitting in a in a conference room and having this discussion but i speak to you each one personally right so mm -hmm. um, I'm yeah, so we're we're definitely thinking about everything, but it's you know it's like a function of risk versus yeah. reward, right? Like you have to like see. I would argue that what happened during that time, yes, it was great, and they, like I don't I'm not gonna name any of those companies that emerged during that time, but where are they now? <laughs> yeah, some of them were backed by the biggest names in the world, including like Sequoia. Okay, where are they now? And I would I would also argue that maybe they brought a ton of heat to this space, yes. right? In the sense of bringing on shit coins and offering it to the world, um, that that they're not here to be found anymore, and and they could potentially be, you know, seen as like a source of a lot of those frustrations. So yeah, but in the end of the day, you know, like I said, you know, when the court case happened and we were fighting it, though. Like how many people were left in the courtroom? Like you were there, right? How many people were actually fighting the real battle? There's a lot of people tweeting, a lot of tweeters out there. We love them. But how many people were actually fighting on the ground, putting money and time and resources? I know only Harish was there. And he, he was there in every sitting uh, that was there. Okay. Yeah, I know that. So in, when the arc of time, maybe we got surpassed by others if you use the word surpassed in the tech contextual sense of they were making more money. But like I said, for Unocoin, it hasn't been about just making money. It's about, you know, building a business that's here for the next hundred years. It's about building, you know, building a loyal customer base that we're not here to try and con or screw uh, from day one. You know, anytime anything went wrong, even if something was Suffolk is very, you know, forward and like, we'll write a long blog and, you know, whatever it is, like, I feel, you know, people have a good memory. And, and like I said, we can bring on any kind of whatever asset coin, it's easy, ERC20, are you kidding me? I, I'm not even that good of a programmer. I could list an ERC20 token and they call that innovation. That's not innovation. That's called systematically scamming people. <laughs> so anyway, so my, my point is, is like, look, we're in it for the long game. Uh, you know, we're not in it to make a quick buck. And uh, yeah, and we're going to keep trying to do that. We're going to keep trying to do that at scale. No, I'm very happy to hear that. Um, I am sure that, you know, the association that IAMI is, um, you know, at least the members of those associations are forward, uh, you know, going forward and, you know, helping each other out in to build this better ecosystem. You, you're, you're making expressions like I've... I'm like, I'm wrong. Am I wrong? No, you're totally right. No, I just want to make a point on the IMA thing is that you're right. They were the entity that was the face of this fight, right? Yes. And that was awesome. And again, we talk about, because you brought up competition, right? So I get a little bit riled up about competition. Again, I'm not naming anyone, but um, let's say the market leaders that you could argue today, when did they join the IAMAI? Like a few, like a month ago after the whole court case was done, right? So what I'm trying to say is, is that people are getting shine in India and it's because, you know, they're to some extent, I think, writing off of the fight that we fought in the court battle. And the reason I'm getting worked up is all I'm saying is that we want competition. I just said I love Zeb Pay and Mahin. We're not afraid of competition. But when it comes to like taking on some of the expenses and paying lawyers and being in the courtroom and fighting the good fight, it's important that even the ones that get acquired by big names, right? That they step up and that they help. That's all I'm saying, <laughs> right? Well, am I wrong? That means you're an Indian, right? Oh, no. Like, tell me, like, should people not, like if you're making money, you shouldn't be running for the hills when it's time to fight. So people should fight is all I'm saying. And fight with us. We're all fighting for the same thing to some extent. I don't think that a lot of people know what actually trans uh, transpired behind the scenes in this court, uh, in the court, you know, entire case and all that. Uh, but the picture is that, you know, those who are here right now actually had a fair share of, uh, you know, investment into the court case. If that is not. And would not you agree with that as somebody who is an insider? <laughs> I, I can't comment as an insider, but I can hear you say that. Uh, you were in the courtroom with Harish. Who else was there? 
<laughs> Nobody. <laughs> right? Nobody else was there. So and and I can I can see what you are saying and I can understand that and I think that it's a it's the part of the story that needs to be told to the people uh, who are interested in the ecosystem, right? Uh, there are like if there are a lack like 100,000 people who are currently active in the ecosystem, it's only a thousand who wants to know these stories, right? The next, the other 99,000 are the people who are hunting for profits and then they're going to get out of it, whether it's your exchange or any other exchange or anything else, right? So, and and, and Amish, mark my words, the story, I know we've done a really poor job as a company to get the word out, but mark my words that the word will get out. And, you know, with backers like Max Kaiser and Barry Silbert, who own Coindesk and Tim Draper that like, you know, run the world, we will get the word out, but we're going to do it when the time is right. Um, yeah. and, and again, my only point, I'm not trying to be, you know, adversarial. All I'm saying is like, it's risk and reward. So when it comes time to take on that risk, we should all be there together and not run for the hills, not run I, for the hills. That's what I, I saw happen in, in mass. And if everyone does that, and if Harish and Satvik also did that, there would be no Bitcoin today in India. Absolutely. I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I could not agree more with you, right? And um, that's absolutely. So we've covered the entire story. It started with you in 2011. And then it's, uh, you know, Unocoin. And then came along the competitions. And then came along the court case. We are right into 2020 now, um, you know, and uh, you've closed around from the biggest names in the industry what now like what can we expect now from no point you know from you also personally magic <laughs> <laughs> so one rule we have generally i mean i don't know who you've been talking to but i'm gonna have to have a talk with the guys we never talk about the future we never talk about it we just build it <laughs> uh, the reason is is the reason is, is that it's like a recipe for disaster, right? If you make even to your girlfriend, if you make, if you keep making promises, you're bound to let people down. So what we do is we make promises internally. We tell each other, like, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to run this experiment, that experiment. And then based on science and based on market feedback, we scale up, we scale down. Like, you know, so are we even for sure going to do derivatives? Maybe, maybe well, not. <laughs> It's not insider information. It's no, no, I, I think it was in the paper or something as well. <laughs> no, no, no. But you know what I'm saying is, is like the future we think is very exciting. So look, we're lo rolling in. So we're considering Uno Dax, like the last whatever, kind of like the beta phase. We feel like we've run all our tests now. We're going to launch. We, we, I think we already have. Uh, we've rolled Uno Dax into Uno Coin because Uno Coin is one with yep. a million and a half users, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. So we're rolling that in now and that's being rolled in. So that's going to obviously, you know, that's one of our focuses and, you know, we're bringing on, um, yeah, just, you know, onboarding for that and trying to make sure that, you know, that becomes super competitive and we think it'll be, you know, give us like another two or three months. So we think we'll be, yeah, doing good things on that front. Um, we were off, you know, lending, that's something we launched recently, right? That's something we're trying to get the word out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and lots of other things, man, lots of other things. We're, we're pumped. We're pumped. Uh, okay. I'd say, yeah, maybe we'll just stop there. So I don't know. We have lots of exciting things we're working on. Would you say that there was a lack of marketing uh, from Unocoin's side along the years? You know, you could have done better in terms of getting the word out, right? Um, you mean after the RBI ban went into place? Uh, not just that, like through, through the time being uh, uh, that Unocoin has, uh, you know, existed. Like, uh, I feel like the other exchanges did a good job getting their word out. And Can I share something with you? You know, so during this court case two years, I um, I think it's pretty publicly known that uh, the Jesse Rash offered me a job as their head of global business development. Like I had, you know, gods like Dan Held reporting to me. Like what? It was like a dream job. Okay. Um, do you know how much money that the Kraken has actually spends on Google ads? Like, I don't think they spend anything. Like these guys they don't do any marketing and they are, they just became a bank. They're killing it on every front. So to me, I think we've done too much marketing. I think, I think we've done oh, way too much marketing. Okay. I don't think it's about marketing. I don't think it's about marketing. I think it's about building products that people love and people care about. Because you know what? If we do that, you're going to go tell everyone you know. <laughs> because it helps solve a problem in your life. Like that's the best form of marketing is to build something remarkable. And yes, we, I, yeah. So I don't think we fall on that. You know, I think some other guys tweet better than us. 
we could we could definitely pick up our tweet game that's for sure uh but that's about it <laughs> directions that uh that now people have figured out where they are going uh, sorry sorry now. sorry i think the arrows that you are throwing or the direction of those have been already been figured out by the audience if they are still here and watching the video or <laughs> right maybe, now yeah or they shut it off a long time ago but you <laughs> know, I, but a little bit a little bit of you know uh yeah anyway so i'm sure these guys have a ton of negative things to say about us as well i'm not trying to be negative all i'm saying is you know let's compete let's compete for ideas um but yeah but on the marketing front i don't think we've you know yeah for us it's always been about trying to do things that are inherently like problem solvers like do would think of and and you know if we do that if we keep doing that we strongly believe that will be market dominant, blah, blah, blah. We'll have all that back. And, you know, and again, we've been super quiet for the last two years because of the court case, because we were putting all our resources towards like lawyers and like trying to figure out how to actually win this thing. And did it didn't it make sense. For the, huh? bank, for the bank, how did, how bad did it get for your bank? So the day we won this court case, the bank managers came to Sattvik's home on the weekend to get us signed up. I don't know if that's what you're getting at, but like our, so our banks. How bad was it for you monetary wise? Like how much of a loss did you have to bear, you know? Oh, over the two years because of the yeah. bank notice? Yeah. Maybe if you look, I think in the internet, like, you know, a year and a half ago, we laid off a hundred people. I know. A hundred people, man. People that were like giving their life for this. We had to send them home. They were crying. It was terrible. I mean, that was the biggest loss. Like forget the financial but luckily, because we were around for so long, because we had investors like the biggest names in the world, we were able to weather that storm. And because we had the courage of Sattvik and Harish, right, and their leadership, we were able to weather that storm. But we did zero marketing during that time, ex except for the hundred laying off a hundred people that going viral and the kiosk, you know, debacle. Yeah. Um, you know, we we didn't have the resources, the time, the bandwidth to go and you know, do anything like that. And so, you know, even, even two of us co-founders, like I said, I, I went and joined Kraken, uh, you know, and that's another story in itself, but, but, you know, like we, we literally were running on fumes to the point where we just figured out what the bare minimum we had to do. And just on the quick Kraken note, Jesse said to me, he said, Sonny, you hold on to everything you got, you built, you worked hard for it. Come on board with us. If things work out in India, go back. If they don't keep building with us, like, who on earth says that? So look, like, that's the kind of company that we'd someday like to even, you know, be like a fraction of. Mm -hmm. Like that's, I have a lot of respect for Kraken. <laughs> no, but that's the thing that we see in crypto, like which um, overall, it's a very tiny community compared to other businesses, other industries, right? It's a very uh, close knitted community. There are fights, of course, but it's like family. Um, so only here in this industry, people give those promises, like, come with us because you know you having some issues over there come work for us once you are get ready to get back on your feet go back like there's no there will not have any hard feelings for that right i don't see it happening anywhere else honestly yeah, it's crazy it's crazy it's like a family you know and and the, and the big thanks for me goes to barry again because you know barry organizes events every year or every yeah every year where all of the founders like hundreds of us like every exchange owner in the world get together and we meet up and talk, you know how powerful that is? Like the fact that we, we all can communicate, share best practices, do what's right and help each other. Um, so yeah, man, so there's a lot behind the scenes that enabled Unocoin to still like after, you know, since 20, I think 2011 or 2012, I picked up the domain Unocoin, but since then, almost nine years, eight years, we're still, you know, Adam Draper, one of our investors has a, like a saying, which is like, be, be a cockroach, you know? And, and I think, Uno coin is definitely a cockroach like uh and i mean that in the best possible way if you know what i mean cockroaches don't I die <laughs> even a nuclear you know warfare would never take them out all right so i think that i've, I've uh, it's a very exciting story uh, you know and then you've been trying to get this done for like two years i think right like, so two years ago we started this communication like let's do this let's tell people the story of india you know indian crypto ecosystem and thank you so much for you know sharing that uh, for being here um i think that you know um i can also share some things with you now we can start that part of the session if you want yeah you tell me okay so first of all um 
Yeah, so great. I thought that was awesome. Um, but you tell me, like, do you think it'd be a bit more natural if we, like, if I set up, you set up another time with me um, and we can do like a proper interview. It could be tomorrow, whenever. And then we can make that all about you. Um, because right now we did touch on you a little bit here and there, and it might be a little bit repetitive, but I'd want to kind of do everything. Like, just like how you did with me, I'd want to make, you know, do a proper interview. So do you want to yeah, do that? Piece, yeah, this piece will go on CoinCrunch and that one can go on your podcast. Is it that? Like you can do that, right? Yeah, or you, yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's, yeah, yeah exactly. I want to get that. I mean, do, I was going to say this, but am I allowed to share this on my site? Because I'd like to. <laughs> Feel free to do it, right? All right, awesome. So let's yeah. let's do that, Naimish. Let's set up another time and, and where I interview you because I want to know like full, like your story and your thoughts and I want to hear it. Um, but yeah, sounds good. So let's, let's maybe kill it here, okay? I'm going to, I'm going to shut it off one second.